Hey there, friends. Angus here from Adio Media. Now, before we dive into the podcast, I want to briefly tell you about a free giveaway that I'm having at the moment. Now, I'm giving away five free enrollments to my mobile video blueprint training course. Now, this course will take you by the hand through the nuts and bolts of creating a magnetic, patient attracting video using nothing more than your mobile device. Now, I sell this course over at my website for $397. We've had literally hundreds of happy students through this course and the reviews are fabulous. And I'm also going to be giving away three Rode Smart Lav microphones. Now, they're valued at around $100 each, and these are my absolute favorite mobile microphones. If you're wanting to boost the quality of your videos, then improving your audio is without a doubt one of the simplest and most effective hacks. Now, all you have to do to go into the draw to win one of these awesome prizes is head on over to your podcast app of choice, whether that be iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Rate and review, now important, take a screenshot of the review and send it to me at angus at adiomedia.com. So that's right, head on over to your podcast app of choice, rate and review, take a screenshot of the review and send it to me at angus at adiomedia.com. Now the competition closes on October 11th and winners will be notified on October 14th. Now let's dive into the show. Podcasting at the start of the year really captured my eye, really captured my attention. Um, Reason being is that I'd used podcasts before to grow businesses and content had been a huge part of how we'd uh, actively marketed business before. I had a lot of success from it, but particularly in the start of 2019, um, it got a bit crazy. The industry has exploded. I actually think it's probably one of the most effective marketing channels. And just if you have a business, like it's the most effective like growth engine you can attach. Welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast, where we guide natural health and wellness experts through the pitfalls of marketing. Each episode, you'll learn simple, effective, easily actionable, and heart-centered marketing strategies. And here's your host, Angus Pike. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, gang. Welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. I'm here today with the amazing Charlie. Now, Charlie is a serial business owner. He's an educator from my hometown here in Melbourne, Australia. So we've got a local show happening today. Now, he's best known for many things, but he's a whiz when it comes to scaling businesses. So moving beyond just us as practitioners. He's great with business automation. He's wonderful with uh, virtual uh, assistants and online teams. And Perhaps we'll talk about that later in this podcast. But really what we're going to talk about today is how can a podcast be an unfair advantage for your practice? So, Charlie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Angus. It's a pleasure to be here. It's nice to have you here too. So uh, you're uh, uh, an old hand at this podcast thing. And of recent, I've been chatting with people all around the world and with wacky times late in the, mo- in the nights and early in the morning. So it's nice to have somebody that we're kind of both here on local time frames. Yeah, it was a nice convenient time. I was I was thrilled and, you know, always a bit of Melbourne represent, always a bit, big fan. Yeah, absolutely. Now, for our um, audience that don't know a little bit of your background, can you kind of catch us up to speed and then we're going to kind of dive into this whole thing all about podcasting? Absolutely. So I'll, I'll do the, the quick summary of the important bits. Hmm. Um, I first got online when eBay took off. So back when that was a huge craze, I'm sure everyone I know can remember that time. It was like all of a sudden you could sell things on the internet. Um, I started importing products from overseas and selling them in Australia. And that was kind of my first taste at the internet and became very, very addicted quickly. From there, I sold my eBay business and got into marketing. That was the element I really enjoyed. Used to love getting like the rankings happening on eBay. And I I don't know if you remember, but if you ever sold anything on the eBay app, um, it used to make a sound like a cash register. Yes. And and that was super exciting. And I had a whole bunch of fun with that. But more than anything, I loved making that happen. I loved making sales and, you know, persuading people in the copy um, or getting them to find my listing. Like it was a very, very exciting time. And I was thoroughly engaged and interested with the internet and internet marketing. As I mentioned, sold the eBay business and started my own marketing agency. That was a wild ride. I grew that business substantially, well into seven figures. Uh, Had about 15 staff uh, working for me at that time. And we were spending crazy amounts on Google ads and Facebook ads. That was our specialty. So we're spending about $3 million, $4 million a year on ads. Really, really wild time. Uh, Really, really fun time. I was one of the early adopters. Uh, After that, 
got out of the agency, so got acquired and sold that one off. You're sensing a trend here of uh, certain events that happened. And then I got into an outsourcing company. So while I had the agency, I um, had a client who was actually helping me find staff, a girl called Lynn, uh, who is my business partner at Outsourcing Angel. But she was finding us this great virtual team members to work at my agency. Um, and then I was using those team members to grow the agency, which was great. And then when the agency ended, I ended up going, do you know what? It was a really great experience getting those team members and staff. I want to do that for other people. I think if more people had a really good virtual experience, um, they'd be able to grow businesses much more quickly and really compete against businesses that only had local staff. So me and Lynn, um, we got into Outsourcing Angel, uh, which is still going today and I'm still a part of. Um, but that business grew rapidly. Like we absolutely hit a nerve and timing and like just exploded. Like we went from this little team of there was like six of us to before, you know, there was like a hundred of us. <laughs> so um, crazy, crazy times. It was really exciting. Did a lot of stuff in outsourcing from there. Um, that company is still going, but um, I'm actually not in the management team anymore. We've got fantastic team there and I'm uh, playing and pursuing with other endeavors as well. So podcasting at the start of the year, really captured my eye, really captured my attention. Um, reason being is that I'd used podcasts before to grow businesses and content had been a huge part of how we'd uh, you know, actively marketed a business before. And I had a lot of success from it, but particularly in the start of 2019, um, it got a bit crazy. The industry has exploded. I actually think it's probably one of the most effective marketing channels and just if you have a business, like it's the most effective like growth engine you can attach to a business in 2019. So that's kind of how I ended up in the podcasting space and very interested. From there, I've grown a media agency that, to no surprise, focuses on podcasts. So I have Valor Media, which is my podcast media agency where we help clients uh, build podcasts to accompany their business to basically be their growth engine to be that thing that um, helps them attract customers, helps them produce leads and sales, and then ultimately helps them produce profit for their business. So you talked a little bit about the kind of growth of uh, podcast. I heard a stat recently, I think it was from the guys over at, you know, it doesn't matter where it was coming from too, but they were talking about the kind of average listen time to a podcast and that it being kind of, you know, 75% completion or sort of 30 minutes or so, that when you compare that to the seconds that often happens with the Facebook app and stuff like that too, it, it has me think about what a powerful media tool it is to build relationships as, as well. So what are some of the trends and stuff that are happening with podcasting at the moment in terms of growth? All right. So I actually want to go into a few things here because you've, you've absolutely said something. I mean, uh, we're obviously converted. Okay. Like we yes. do podcasts. Um, we like podcasts. We're incredibly biased um, as we should be. By mm. the way. Um, but at the start of 2019, there was a few events that happened, which really like piqued my interest. This is why I've gone or gotten so bullish on it. So I'll go through them now. Mm. So the number one that I heard of is that Spotify, um, we're investing $500 million into acquiring podcast-related businesses to grow their podcast presence. Yeah, okay. Just, just a casual half a bill, you know. <laughs> yes, what, chump what's change. That, what's that between friends? Nothing, yes. Nothing. Drop in the ocean. Yes. Um, right, so you can see when, it, when a company like that is looking to go, all right, we want to spend half a billion dollars in being present in podcasting, um, that, that piqued my interest. That said, I was like, that's a big move. Um, and they've gone on a rampage acquiring tools and uh, media companies and doing very well from it, by the way, as well. The second one that come up, so, you know, here, here at once, you've got me interested. But then the second one was Google. Mm -hmm. So Google uh, announced that they're now indexing podca podcasts in the search results. And they're actually, if you've got a podcast on Google, they're transcribing it behind the scenes and putting it on Google. So um, I know your audience is a lot of practice owners or mm -hmm. you know, health space, but let's say you've got a podcast on how to fix your sciatica. Yes. Rather than it just appearing in like the podcast search now, it's now going to be indexing on Google. So they're actually opening up discoverability. Yes. So it's going to get easier for podcasts to be found on Google now, which I think is, I can't, how can I, I'm already a pretty excited talker, but um, I could be more excited about that because if more people are, discovering podcasts in that way, then that's opening the door to growing the audiences even further. And then the next one that happened, like this just kept going. So at this point, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm sensing a big wave here. I'm, I'm sensing a move. And then Apple 
announced that they're hugely updating uh, their podcast experience and software through iTunes and separating the app on desktop. Um, you also notice if you've been paying attention to this space is that they've been putting a lot of effort and work into improving their new and noteworthy section, how podcasts are appearing. Um, so again, we're talking about like three giant companies investing huge amounts, huge into ensuring that this space is going to grow. Um, and one of the things I'm a really big believer on is when you can spot these moves, jump on them, like absolutely piggyback on the huge expense that's happening there. And then lastly, we've got one more point here is that every new car that is built in 2019 and onward comes standard with a podcasting integration. Mm. So it's like all of these things are behind in what was already an industry, which is going to turn into like a hugely explosive industry. And I think we've got five years of just enormous growth coming before we start to head into like a more maintained level. Yeah, I think it's it's starting, you know, think of that concept of there being a podcast, you know, kind of app built into it. It's a bit like having Netflix built into your car, obviously. You go, okay, got it. What's happening with consumption rates? Are they going up as well? Are more and more people, and any ideas, like what percentage of the public are actually listening to podcasts at this moment? Okay, so I, I want to go back to that because these are the, the big moves and I'll, I'll loop into that because it's a really important thing. Um, when you think about, uh, I'm going to specifically make this in a business sense now. So if you're a business owner from here and you're doing any form of marketing, right? There's a huge difference between someone who, let's say, watches a 15 second video on Facebook or sees an ad versus someone who's listened to you for three hours in total time. Yes. Yeah. The quality of uh, that lead or prospect or engagement level from there. So I think podcasting has got a huge advantage, huge advantage in the relationship you build with a potential audience member or potential uh, prospect or lead in coming into your business. But it's become this really, really fascinating thing that as these do better, we're seeing more and more people shift into deeper consumption of content. So moving to your point from there. So what we see that's really, really interesting is that for a lot of people, the average listen time of their show is around 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So 30 minutes of consumed content is what we see on average across all the shows we manage. And I think that's a, a really, really good depth to see. I, I, that, it, it blows my mind. When I first started to kind of hear the stats in terms of the consumption time inside of there, and inside my practice, the, uh, the way that I built my practice kind of a 15 or so years ago, Charlie, was really through workshops. We would have people come into workshops or I'd go into businesses to have workshops. And they used to be about 30-minute kind of presentations that we do and then we would invite people into the practice. And it was a really big deal. Like I would do them, if I could get four or more people in the room and to listen to me for that 30 minutes, like it would be a winner for me as well. And as time has gone on, it gets more and more difficult for people to come to any kind of live event. And I think about now that hopefully what, if you're listening to this as a practitioner and you think, man, here's another whole way that you can start to build relationships with your, your, your community. And that, you know, if you listen to my podcast for any length of time, then I think marketing and the equation is simple as this. The more people that know you, like you and trust you in your community, the busier your practice is going to be. And I don't reckon there's a better, and I'm a huge fan of video because you know that I've been talking and teaching video for the last decade, but it's hard to get people to watch a lot of videos because there's so much distraction and there's not a more intimate tool. And I, I really mean to use that word intimate tool than a podcast to do it. I'm, I'm like you, I'm so bullish that I want practitioners to do it. The challenge is this. For so many practitioners are thinking, Angus, how am I going to come up? Like, I know you're doing an episode, two episodes a week. I've got patients to look after. Like, how long do they need to be? What am I going to talk about? How am I going to get people to listen to it? And then when that starts to happen, they're pulling their hair out as, as well. So can we circle around and start to identify all of those kind of things there? First of all, like, like what kind of things, you know, we've got a local chiropractic practice that wants to start a podcast. Like, what should they be talking about? How long should it be? How do they get it out to their community? And then how do we deal with the tech? Lots of questions. Let's Ooh. go. <laughs> Tell you what, let, let's just let's break this down a little bit uh, from there. That is, that is a huge amount of questions. We can get through all of that. I've got yes. some, uh, some fantastic information that would really help from there. But I'll, I'll pose this firstly. And it's like, I, I just look at it this way. If I had a practice and I was a, a chiropractor, we'll use that as the example. Mm. Uh, there's a huge difference in someone coming into my clinic that uh, let's say just found me on Google and has just got a problem to solve 
versus someone that's been educated via the podcast and is coming in and recognizing me as the expert. Yeah, totally. So, I've recognized that it's a very different relationship. And the thing, like if I was a chiropractor, I'm pretty sure I know which person I want coming in. Yes. I want someone that's seeking me out because of my expertise. They understand my methodology or ways I like to work with clients. And they're probably going to pay me a premium to have that experience. So yeah. I look at it and go, you know, first up is that if you're an expert in what you do, and I think anyone with a doctor title, Mm -hmm. He's an expert in what they do. Yes. Um, then the type of people you want coming into your practice has to shift from this old game of like just Google and pumping AdWords and things like that because I think it produces um, a churn and burn relationship. I think yeah, it puts totally. a lot of pressure on the practice. Yeah. So that's the first thing I'll say. Um, the second thing I'll say here is that you're absolutely right when it comes to podcasting is like it's not a small task. It's not something that doesn't require effort or work. And I think it's absolute madness that if you are a doctor, again, if you are an expert, is that you would spend your time on any of the back end stuff. So the editing of audio or video, the publishing onto things like iTunes and Apple and Google and Spotify and the internet in general, and then actually like creating images or show notes or promoting the actual podcast. My belief, and I'll preface this this is an opinion. If you're someone who's into it, you know, each their own. Um, yes. But I think you've got to look at this in a more leveraged way. Like ideally, your expertise and time needs to be focused on those high income generating activities. And then podcasting is something where you want to be the one recording. So definitely you making the content and people getting a feel from you. But from that point onwards, I think you should be very much looking towards a service, handing it off. You just record and then hand it off to other people who can take care of all the grunt work and getting it out there, so to speak. Yeah. And I think too, gang, I mean, there, there obviously are two ways, Charlie, that I think that people can outsource it. And one is to outsource to companies like yours that do this kind of stuff. Or two, the other side of things is outsource to your own staff that you've already got. You know, if you've got a front desk person, um, you know, that you're paying them $20, $25 an hour, teach them how to do the back end of it. You can still keep it all in house. But the only thing that you really need to be responsible for is being the one in front of the microphone that's building the authority, the expertise. So it doesn't, you know, you don't have to do everything. I think that's really important, you know, to, you know, to touch on that point as, as well. So if we've got over the hurdle of, of that kind of stuff, uh, because, and maybe we can use this as an example, because you were talking before the show, like you actually have a surgeon who has a podcast exactly. as well. So what are they talking about? How long are their episodes? How often are they doing them? Um, can you can you share some thoughts there? Yeah, I'll, I'll share a whole bunch of things here. And, and I just want to come back to, absolutely, if you've got underutilized staff in your, you know, that might be something they can get upskilled or trained in as well. Like, I think that's a great example. Um, and, some, you know, utilizing existing assets can be a fantastic way of doing things. Now, I'm very fortunate. We actually manage a few shows in this space. So a surgeon and also uh, someone in a health niche. Um, oh, sorry, they do like, it's like diabetes treatments. I don't know. Yep. Forgive my lack of terminology here. I'm not, I'm not down with completely with it, but that's what they do. That's what they help with with that. Yes. Okay. So the first thing I, I want to really recognize here is like, absolutely, these guys are doing it because they want to produce new clients for their business. Yes. Now, that's like their goal and intent. They're not doing it to stroke their own ego. They're not doing it because they like the own sound of their voice. It's like very much for business gains. So mm -hmm. that's the intent. The second thing we kind of look into there, which I think is really important, and it's funny that both of them have said this, is they've both said they want to diversify their income away from client services. So maybe having accompanying services. So I'll give you a really good example is let's say we'll do chiropractic again. They've got their chiropractic uh, treatment where people can come in, but they also want to offer like courses on, I think one of the ones we looked at was like, you know, maybe it's stretching. Maybe it's back health, maybe it's um, diet or something like that. So they're bringing in products and offerings that are more informational that they can then sell uh, to accompany either client treatments or sell individually. So it's a great way to kind of create another purchase point. Yes. So this is like, hey, this is where I'm going to get my upsell. This is how I'm going to get some profitability out of what can be a very uh, high overhead business model. So, you know, they're the type of intentions and things people have looked at from there. Um, and I think is really, really cool. Now you asked the next question about like, how do I work out what to speak about? How do I, how do I know what to speak about? And what I thought was really interesting was some of the things I've enjoyed 
is case studies talking about the, you know, obviously not naming people without their permission or Mm -hmm. giving away details that would have privacy out of concern, but speaking in general terms about the things you're doing and how they're helping people solve problems. So that's been a really, really interesting one. And um, when you think about it, right, I don't know about you, if you, if you had a health problem and then just ever attacked Google or searched for solutions for it. Mm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, like trying to drink out of a fire hose um, and it's confusing. Super. Like we, we had a conversation before here and I told you that uh, previously I'd had an incident where I fell off my push bike. Um, fell off's a kind word. I stacked, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, way past my own ability level. But anyway, the point being is like I hurt my back and it's like I had a sciatica, but I didn't know that. I'd never even heard of what a sciatica is. Yes. So, so what did I do for hours? I sat on the internet and looking in ways to like, you know, what, what's my issue here? Yes. Um, so I think there's this really interesting combination tying into what we mentioned about Google doing a lot of indexing now, mm-hmm. um, which means putting on Google about, you know, there's people looking to solve problems. So if you're in a practice, that's what you do. That is your profession, solving problems for people, whether it's back pain, whether it's uh, diet related stuff, perhaps it's like how to help someone with their health, exercise, so many things, surgical things. So giving people uh, before and afters or case studies or talking about that type of stuff, I think is hugely powerful. The next part is I think when you're getting really common questions. So every time you're bringing a client in and they're asking the same series of questions, I think that's a great thing for content. Now, I think if you're, if you're a doctor or you have a practice and you just follow those first two things, I think you've just officially never ran out of things to say. Yeah. Ever. But I want to throw one more in. Can I throw one more in? Yeah, please. Let's over deliver. Sorry, let's over deliver. Let's go for it. Um, one of the ways I've seen this used really, really well is that let's say for a doctor who wants to receive uh, some acknowledgement in their industry. Yes. If they've used their podcast to uh, bring on other professionals in their industry to talk about important topics, which has often led to either speaking opportunities, book collaborations, content collaborations, um, you know, uh, presentations at like, I don't know what you call these. They're like, uh, events, industry events. We'll go with industry yep. events. Yep. I know happen a lot. So it's ended up becoming like a really powerful networking tool mm-hmm. and collaboration tool for the practice owner as well. So I think there's a few little unique things you can do there to create even better content or specialty things that may fit outside your realm. Yeah, I love those ideas. And I, we talk a lot of them um, over at Audio Media for video. And I think that, you know, if you just talked about, you know, what are the frequently asked questions that you get asked? What are the questions that people aren't asking, but they should be asking? And then I think it's way underutilized the whole, um, you know, we talk about the interview. I mean, it's what I'm doing here. I post two shows a week on the marketing show, marketing your practice show. One of them, I have to come up with a content, but the other one, I'm just talking with somebody. I don't come up with any content at all. And I think we underestimate how valuable a tool is. And then also how much authority and expertise can come out of just interviewing people. And I like to just say, uh, Oprah Winfrey, you know, one of the most powerful people in the world. And she's not a content creator really, but she brings in experts. And obviously she does create her own content. That's unfair for me to say that. But she's just choosing the right people to come on there as, as well. So I think when we really stop, there is no shortage of content for us to kind of create. And my experience is once people get started, they can't stop because each idea kind of leads to another one. Oh, if I just have to that point, I think 90% of the people I work with after they really get into it, at some point I get an email, I've got another idea for a show. Yes. (laughs) Because you get the bug and once you're into the flow and you understand how easy it can be in all honesty. Like it can be a really well, fun experience. Mm. It can be a great networking tool and ultimately it can get people results. And, you know, I don't know about you, but things that get me results, I tend to want to do more of, yeah. which is why it happens. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And again, if, if you're still thinking about, you know, what kind of things should I have in my podcast, another framework that might be kind of helpful for our listeners is, is I think nothing builds trust with your audience more than getting them one step closer to the health outcome that they're looking for. So if we kind of go back to Charlie before saying, look, I fell off my bike, I've got this leg pain and back pain. You know, what information could I share with Charlie over a podcast that can get him one step closer to some relief? 
you know, I could talk to him about, you know, ice or heat. I could talk to him about what things he could do to decrease the inflammation. If it's a video podcast, it would be really easy for me to share some kinds of, uh, you know, stretches that Charlie could be doing, some work he could be doing on the foam roller. And you can kind of imagine if I'm getting Charlie one step closer, if he's starting to feel a little bit better, the authority, the expertise, you know, the celebrity to an extent that you start to build all the trust. Um, you know, when Charlie ends up in the practice, if that's what's happens, he's like a referral. He's, you know, we've already got a relationship and that, as you said before, can lead to increased fees, all those kind of things as, as well, Charlie. So, you know, just to touch on again, there's no shortage of, of, of information. What about length? of podcast you know do you have some thoughts about how long they should be? i mean we've got joe rogan who's doing three hour episodes all the way through to people doing kind of you know i have a snackable kind of 10 minute episode each week as well what are your thoughts this is something we're testing a lot um because we get a, it would be one of the most commonly asked questions um and people tend to think of like oh maybe my content's not long enough um, and I tend to think uh, in these terms, okay, I'll give you a few things is like, there's examples of everyone winning in every form of content. So you've already mentioned Joe here. He does three hour episodes and it's hard to argue against the success he's had. It really is. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side, you look at, there's some really short shows out there that I really enjoy and they serve a purpose to me. So I would really look to, uh, this, and this is what I would there. I think you have to look at where you can be strong. So if you're the type of person that likes interviewing people and you want to go deep and you're really curious and you've got great questions and things like that, and that's going to produce the highest quality and most useful to your audience content, do that. On the reverse, if you're the type of person that on your drive home from your practice, you want to sit your iPhone there and put a lapel mic in and just talk about the problems you solved or para or talk in analogies for some client situations of the day, you know, and that's going to be your show and that's going to give you your best type of content. That could be a really interesting place to start. So I think you've got to lean into where you're strong in content development or the styles of content that are most suited and most convenient to you. And then from there, like build it out a little bit, like play in other things. But I always, as a starting point, lean into where you're strongest. And then from there, look to how you can serve and help your audience best. I don't think length is the question. I think reason to listen and being helpful are the, the most important questions. Mm. We, do you have a definition when you talk about, and this is kind of cycling back in terms of what a podcast is, you know, for, the longest time I've been a podcast listener, you know, from the very, very early days to, and podcast to me was always an audio medium. Um, but now we see a lot more podcasts that are, have a video component. You know, this one here, we have video and audio, and we get kind of pretty equal listens between both of them as well. But is it, you know, can a podcast be a video? Does it, is there a broad definition? What do you, what, what's, what's, what's the go there? So this is a, this is a really interesting one. Um, and I'll say you can be successful in either. Okay. You don't have to be specifically one, but some interesting things have developed. Um, so I, I've, my own podcast is video I'll preface, um, and previous shows I've done have been audio as well, but something really, really interesting happened. Um, with one of my podcasts that we did video, um, we, we put it on YouTube just because we could for no other reason. And what's fascinating is one of my friends, um, really good friend, uh, James actually, um, listens to the audio even though he's watching the video on YouTube. So he just sets it up, puts his phone down, the video is running. He might glance at it here or there, but he's actually having an audio experience. Um, and then for other people I've, I've referenced, they're like full watching the video and they hate the audio. And then other people I know it's all about commute time and they just want to listen to the audio. So we've got a very fragmented audience and ways of experience this. So my philosophy has been this. Let people enjoy on the platform they want, in the medium they want, and enable cross-contamination uh, or cross-pollination, whichever word you prefer there. <laughs> so for us, like what we've been really focused on is creating a show that can be put anywhere, full yes. episodes on Facebook, on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple, on iTunes, and letting people consume in a way that makes sense for them. Because as you speak to people, they're all vastly different in how they like to consume it. So I've gone with the approach and methodologies that you want to allow people to enjoy it in their own experience and, and that will serve you best. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, you know, we might touch on the kind of tech side of things as well. 
having that uh, a podcast have two versions, i.e. video and an audio component. It's really simple. You know, it's not all that much difficulty for, not, not all that much more difficult for me to have both components there and add that into your kind of workflow. And I totally agree. It's interesting. Like I said, there's just a recent, there's some podcasts I've been listening to for years that I've started to kind of consume there, you know, over on YouTube as well. And I'm, it's an interesting experience for me. Like, oh yeah, I'm really quite enjoying this kind of uh, multitasking a bit like you talked about with your friend James before as, as well. One of the other challenges, if a podcast is going to be successful, and particularly we've got small business owners here, in terms of frequency, is it something that they need to commit to on a weekly, monthly basis? You know, could they be doing a series? Um, what are some of the different ways that you're seeing podcasts work? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, this is uh, how I've been looking at it from what I've seen work for all the clients and what I see industry doing as a general, I would say that once a week is the minimum, but I want to make sure I say something really, really important here. That doesn't mean you're recording once a week. That doesn't mean you're producing content every week that you might record once a month and do four episodes in a day. And that goes out over the month. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So just to preface that from there, but from the actual release of content, Definitely once a week is a minimum and twice a week if you've got the capacity is the sweet spot of relevance. But I'll keep in mind, people tend to live in this world. We want to pretend we don't, but we definitely do live in a weekly world. So mm -hmm. we have, you know, weekdays and weekends and most people uh, habitually behave in the same ways across that. So uh, even in my own experience is like I listen to podcasts when I go for a walk. Um, so every time I go for a walk, I listen to a podcast. It's just a habit now. Um, or some people are commuter podcasters. They listen when they drive. Others are gym goers who listen at the gym. And then others are people that watch or do the computer setup from there. So what I really aim for with my shows and the way I think about it is I want to become a part of someone's habit. I want to be habitually informed, like involved in that way. Because if I do that, I know I'm going to build a long lasting and repeat relationship with someone. Yeah. So you said in there too, Charlie, that once a week doesn't mean that I'm recording once a week. So what did you mean by that? Yeah. So even like we're doing right now, like we're on a, a Zoom call and we're recording this, but like it's undoubtable this episode is not going to be live today. Yes. Like it's not going to be like press and play. Good as my workflows are, that's not going to be happening. You're right. <laughs> Um, and do you know what? I wouldn't encourage it either because there's a whole bunch of things that can go wrong or you want to change or a whole bunch of things. So we operate in this world of podcasting of like, you've got recording, which is an event where you record an episode and then you've got publishing, which is a different event. And they definitely don't have to happen on the same day. And I think if they did happen on the same day, you're putting a lot of pressure and stress on yourself and team. So for me personally, like every podcast I record is four weeks delayed before it's actually out. Mm. And why we do that is it gives the team plenty of time to do things like create great graphics, build good videos, set up social posts, publish right show notes, just, you know, to create something that when we market, it's a really strong asset. The other side of it is, is that, you know, some weeks I'm on and some weeks I'm off and, or I might be on holiday or I might just not be feeling it. So I don't want to be under pressure where I've got to record every week and have it be ready every week. I'd much rather take a bit more of a relaxed approach where I've got like some chunking or recording in bulk and then allowing that to flow at a time, which is really powerful. Yeah, so I totally agree. So again, what that might look like for you is it might be kind of one Wednesday afternoon or whatever day a month. And if you decide that your episodes are going to be 20 minutes and you set aside four hours, then you might reasonably get four or five episodes done by the time you have some breaks inside of that. And that's your recording done for the month. Uh, you've got an episode coming out there too. Now, you know, if you think about that, you know, two or three hours once a month to put into a strategy here that helps to build authority and expertise as well. I, I do wonder this as well. And I, I don't know, you know, your talk of it having to be released kind of once a week. I, I wonder too, you know, I look at the success of the show that I think was NPR put out that was called Serial. Um, that so many people listened to, which I think it was called Serial, was about the guy, did he commit the murder? Did he not commit the murder? You know, they have these seasons of shows that come out as well. And, and I often wonder that as a practice, you know, whether we could have seasons of shows where we really picked a topic where, you know, season one was all about sciatica, season two was all about healthy kids, season three um, as well. I, I don't know how that would work, but I, I also wonder that, 
if you can get into the podcast game and your initial commitment was eight episodes to see what kind of happened, what sort of traction that, that you could get from that too. Do you think that's a strategy that's worth exploring or you're like, nah, just do the once a week thing, go from there. What, what are your thoughts? Oh, I've got a strong opinion here and I'll say opinion. <laughs> Um, so first off, I loved cereal. That was a great series. Um, and that type of business is a media business or a TV type business. They're not a small business owner trying to generate leads or anything for their practice or trying to be profitable through there. So this is kind of where I look at it and go like, in general, I want leads and sales for my business every week. Yes. So then I want podcasts going out every week that have a ability to generate and create that experience. Mm. So I, I'm very biased towards creating a weekly show if you're a business owner. I mm. think that there is a phenomenal value in that habit and way of looking at things from there. So that would absolutely be the way I thought of it and the way I went about it. Um, again, that's just, that is a personal opinion, but it's also what I see working really, really strongly. So mm. uh, Serial was a phenomenal one from there and much like many TV series like you know Game of Thrones and things, they have their event and they have these huge off seasons. Unless your business can operate and survive out of it in that way, then I probably would lean away from that concept. Yeah. But I want to, sorry, sorry, I just want to tackle one more thing there though because you mentioned something that's really interesting about you know maybe eight episodes to try it out. I just don't think that's enough. I would really say that if you're going to get into podcasting or this is something you want to do it, actually, I'll, I'll even make this bigger. Do, do you know ultimately why I love podcasting so much? No, tell me more. Compound interest. Yes. Oh God, I love it. It's like one of the only things in marketing that you can create compound interest. When you have a podcast, each episode builds on the last. It's not a new start. And there's very, very few other things that offer that in business in the same capacity. Mm. So like um, much to like financial success and wealth creation, compound interest can be amazing. Um, and I really think you can get the same out of podcasting and I've experienced it myself so many times and seen it so many times. But if you look at it, like when you're starting from zero, the reality is, is that getting your initial traction is probably one of the most challenging parts. But years into it, you can always be lazy and people will listen to you. Um, so you've got this really interesting thing where it's like eight episodes, I'd probably say is a bit thin. I'd yeah, say yeah. you'd want to go about it for like a three month minimum. Yes. And then whatever you're achieving towards the end of that three months, that's your new baseline. So mm -hmm. you've got so much more chance of having a much bigger next three months, so to speak. So I wouldn't be like, make it eight episodes and see how it goes. I'd like commit to three months and then towards the end of the three months, start judging the experience if it's suitable from there. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice, Charlie. I, and I totally agree. I, I, and we haven't talked about this because when we said at the start in terms of defining, like what's the outcome that we're after with our podcast? And if the outcome that we're after with our podcast is really leads or new business through the door. I also think that there's another thing, that another goal that we can have with our podcast that can coexist inside of that too. And that's retention of our existing patients as well. And in that, I can see that there's a framework that seasons might work there in that if you happen to find me via the old Google um, and you're in my practice as well, and you do have sciatica and you're on my adjusting table and I want to have a conversation with you that is a 30 to 40 minute conversation that's not practical for me to have at that moment because I've got five people waiting for the next appointment. I think it's, there's an opportunity here for you. You happen to be saying, look, Angus, is there some foods that I could be eating that will help my body recover? I'm like, Charlie. Great question. I've answered that in episode two of my podcast. I'm going to have Mackenzie up at the front desk, send that through to you as, as well. It's 30 minutes, it dives deep into that. And then once you've had a listen to that, we can talk more about that on our next visit. I can see a podcast in that episode, in that situation through there, that to be great for me to add extra value to you, for me to continue to build authority, all those kind of stuff, and help you get closer to your result. And in that way there, I might say that there might be some benefits you know, from a retention tool as, as well. Do you have some thoughts about that as a strategy? So I, I want to use myself as an experience here. Okay, we're talking about going to the chiropractor. When, when I went to the chiropractor for my sciatica, they had me download some app and then they put exercises on the app. And I'm going to be honest, it was a pretty poor after experience. Yes. Like was, I could have found it on YouTube. Like what are you, what are you wasting my time for? Yes. Um, what I would have loved is what you just said. 
I would have absolutely loved if you had a similar story, if you had an explanation of why you're giving me these things to do and how important they are. And then if you could really help guide me to my path to recovery, ultimately, it would have been amazing. I would have loved that because I would have put that podcast on, on the way home and you would have got 30 minutes with me to yes. explain to me what's going on, what needs to happen, what's going to come next, yeah. how to go about it. So I think that's a phenomenal idea. I think that's better than some of the ideas I've referenced early. So for that alone, it would be worth doing a podcast for your practice. Yeah. But I'll throw something in that I think is even more important. A few weeks, like I had this sciatica incident and then I had to go to the, I was going to the chiropractor for months and towards the end of it, like I was feeling fine. Like after four weeks and they released my back or whatever and um, I was feeling much, much better, right? What they did a really poor job of is explaining the maintenance part or while I was still going to the chiropractor. And I was like, uh, towards the end of it, I was having this experience where it just felt like a rort of financial exchange. Yes. Like I didn't actually feel like he was helping me much more. Couldn't explain much of the stuff he's doing. I don't know if he was having a bad day or really busy as well, but it's like the communication was terrible. Mm. Um, and ultimately I stopped going there because I'm like, well, I don't feel like I'm gaining anything out of this more than anything. It's time out of my day and I'm spending money for no perceivable uh, gain here. Like I can stretch, I'm well into my yoga stuff again now. Things are feeling really great. Like why should I be going? So I think you can really attack a lot of those things because I could have been dead wrong. Maybe I was at my most dangerous point. Who knows? Or maybe it's, you know, probably shouldn't deadlift after a sciatica, but who knows? <laughs> again, yeah. I think there's a huge opportunity to improve the communication and relationship with your client there. And yeah. I looked at that and said, if that chiropractor had had a podcast that would have done what you just suggested, I would have had a much better relationship with them. And ultimately, I mean, not that we want to make this the thing, but I would have probably more happily spent more with you. <laughs> well, if they, and, and, and not, because spending more is greater, there's value. Like I think as service providers, we ultimately want to be providing more value than what we're charging for. That's what, you know, is the foundation of a really great business. And what, what I love about things like video and any online communication podcast as well is its ability for leverage. Um, you know, and for ease as, as well. Because if I had had that same conversation to you where I said to you, Charlie, if you come back on Wednesday night, I've got a workshop here that's going to talk to you about. It's like, oh, man, Wednesday nights, that's when I'm normally going out for my, you know, I've got racing on Wednesday nights and my bike. But if it is, by the time you get to the front desk, if Mackenzie has texted that through to your phone and you're in your new 2019 car that has a podcast app in it, and then you've got me while you're driving home, we're having that conversation there. I, 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 I get really excited about the ability for us to continue to add value into somebody's life in that kind of scenario um, as, as, as well. So, you know, I can see lots of different ways that we can be using podcast, not just because you, you introduced us to that word called the after experience. So, you know, we've talked lots about the before experience before somebody even gets into our practice. You got kind of two marketing nerds talking here about kind of breaking stuff down there as well, but it, it, you know so much of it can be used in other um, uh, sides of things as well. Can we move on a little bit now to the tech side of things? You know, what are the bare minimums that I need tech wise in order for me to you know have a podcast? You know, people might be watching this video now. They see two guys here with big old fancy overcompensating microphones. Um, so uh, I, I'm noticing yours looks considerably bigger than mine too, Charlie, but I'm not sure if that's just lens distortion. So um, what do we need technique or technology wise to pull this off? Yeah, the great question again there. Um, the first thing I'll say is like, as all things, you can go crazy. You really can, especially in tech. And I certainly have. Like, this is what we do. I feel an obligation to take it to the extreme and demonstrate what can be done here. But for the average person, I'm like, what are the bare minimums from here? And I say, like, what are the minimums? Not like what's the cheapest, but like what's going to get you an acceptable standard that would be comparable to this show or my show or any other show? Ultimately, like budget-wise, for under $500, you can have everything you need. Like under $500 is a very safe budget. I would say probably even under $300 um, would get you a very reasonable setup. So budget wise, that's what I'd expect. What you would actually need. Um, I'm a really big fan of the microphone you have. Um, mm -hmm. They're fantastic. I can see the Rode on here as well. I'm on a Rode microphone. Mm -hmm. So uh, a Rode USB microphone would be a fantastic start. Um, a good set of headphones would be a great start. 
And then a webcam that I would recommend the Logitech C920 or the Logitech uh, Brio. Um, and I think if you're starting from that point with a computer or mobile phone as your driving device, that would be everything you need to have a wildly successful show. You really don't need to go past that. Um, certainly can, and I can recommend a whole bunch of stuff from there, but we'll probably save that from another conversation. Yep. And so the microphone here, I think these are under a couple of hundred bucks. The uh, Rode Podcaster is the one that I'm using. And I happen to have that exact uh, webcam that you were talking about beforehand as well. And then I also shoot just another footage over the side over here just on my iPhone. So I've got a second angle from there too. But it doesn't have to be, I agree, some good quality audio goes a long way. But even things, what are your thoughts even on the Rode uh, SmartLav microphones and stuff like that too, which are even cheaper? I mean, they're under a hundred bucks. Um, would that would that be enough? Yeah, look, absolutely. It would be. So I'll just preface that. If you're doing solo episodes, so it's just you and you're maybe driving home in the car or just want to work with a smartphone, a Rode Smart Lab, they're like $89 on eBay. Mm. Aussie $89 as well. So no, no uh, creep up there. But that is enough. And your smartphone camera is enough. And you can produce some phenomenal uh, quality content that would be perfectly comparable to a lot of people and what they make. Um, so that would be perfect. If you're going to be doing interviews though, um, if you're going to be using a computer and going into that, I would recommend uh, one of the mics we use uh, for the reason being that they have this amazing ability to really reduce background noise and pick up echo inside. So why these are just so great is compared to that smart lav, which gives a more open audio, you'll mm -hmm. sound much more like a radio presenter and just produce like the quality jump is worth it when it comes to doing interviews uh, and things that go in line with doing it on your computer. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. So I want to kind of bring this back as a little bit of a summary as, as we kind of wind things up through here as well. We kind of started off gang and, and Charlie said, you know, why is podcasting such a win? We've got Spotify spending half a billion dollars. We've got Apple diving deep. We've got Google who are starting to index things. Now, when we want to just follow the big guys, if they're investing time, effort and energy, then they think that there's a tidal wave that's, that's coming, you know, and it fits so nice hand and glove that says really what we want as a small practitioners, as small businesses, as, as health practitioners, is we want more people knowing, liking and trusting us. And then on top of that too, you know, what continues to blow me away, and Charlie kind of mentioned it too, when people are listening to podcasts, they're listening to them for a long time. And not that it's necessarily a guarantee, but the more time people are listening to you, the faster they're going to get through that buyer's journey of knowing, liking and trusting you as, as well. The technology doesn't have to be difficult. You know, 500 bucks gets you set up in an amazing way, maybe even less than that um, as, as well. Two ways you can do this. You can do this all yourself and train your staff to do it. There's loads of information online, uh, uh, plugins and the back of your uh, WordPress site, all those kind of things there too. But Charlie, if somebody wanted to reach out to you and your team, how could you help kind of take a lot of this off their hand and, and, and get them an even better result? Yeah, great question. Um, so what we do, I'll, I'll hopefully got the time to tell a brief story here. Yeah. Um, what I really noticed in this industry is there's a lot of people out there who are experts who basically wanted to do a podcast, but maybe don't have the capacity or ability to do it themselves. So I had some friends reach out and say, I want to do one, happy to record, but I, ne I need this team. I need a strategy. I need someone who can guide me. So what I've built in my agency, Valor Media, is we're like a done for you podcasting agency where an expert can come and work with us, we'll help you with the strategy, we'll design the show, and then we'll take care of all the editing, production, publishing, putting it on social media, the whole, you know, very hands off experience for someone that comes in there. So that's, that's what we do as a business. Mm -hmm. That's something we really enjoy. Um, and what you gain out of that is you're getting someone who knows what they're doing. You don't have to work out a lot of the stuff or training side of things from there. So if someone was interested in doing a show and wants to have a very hands-off experience, but take advantage of my expertise and my team's expertise, the best place they can go is valamedia.com. And I'm sure we'll put a link where this episode is or I'll, I'll tee something up so that uh, anyone can find us with ease. Yeah, great. I'll make sure that we have all the kind of show notes where you can get and kind of follow Charlie up as, as well. So Charlie, have you got any kind of final thoughts and kind of winding things up from today that you want to leave our audience with? Absolutely. Um, we spoke about this idea of like, could a podcast be an unfair advantage for a uh, clinic? Like, could it be so? And I hope we've demonstrated this, but you know, to recap and realign with what we've said here is like, if you could, I'll put it bluntly, is like your competition isn't going to do this. 
Yes. Right. This is something I look at and go from looking at if you are the person doing this and your competition is not, it's going to give you a huge leg up. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned, you know, the before experience of finding clients or um, exposure to leads, the idea of being able to create supplementary um, resources for aftercare and enhancement. And I think the ability to move into other things, whether it's information products um, or collaborations with other owners, it all sums up into why this can be true. So I just want to make sure I'm, I'm emphasizing and looking at if you're a practice owner, like this really can be your unfair advantage to other clinics and perhaps a strategy you might want to look at doing. Yeah, love it. You've got me hooked on it too. I, I think it's a great tool. I think it's a, a, and, and that concept, I don't think you could have put it better in terms of it being an unfair strategy um, as well. So, hey, Charlie, on behalf of the Marketing Your Practice podcast, thank you, buddy, for sharing so generously with us today. I feel like there's another whole conversation I'd love to have you in the future of this whole idea of virtual assistance and how we as uh, health practices could kind of take advantage of that. So as opposed to, you know, lots of times the stuff that we need done, we don't require staff in, in-house. So maybe can I be so cheeky as perhaps sometime down the track to have a round two where we might kind of dive into how we could do that? Would be my absolute pleasure. Would love to come back on. Lovely, mate. Well, until next time, gang, you've been listening to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. Charlie, thanks for sharing with us so generously here as well. See you soon, mate. Angus back here again, and thanks for listening to the show. Now, don't forget for your chance to win one of five enrollments to the mobile video blueprint training, valued at $397 or one of three Rode Smart Lab microphones, be sure to head on over to your podcast app of choice, rate and review, take a screenshot of the review and send it to me at angus at adiomedia.com. Competition closes October 11th and winners will be notified on October 14th. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, you have to come and check out the Community Influencer Program. It's my monthly coaching program where we take all this material and I'll work one-on-one with you to apply, implement, systematize, and help guide you and your practice to the next level. Now, you can join me on over at adiomedia.com forward slash join. That's adiomedia.com forward slash join. I'd love to see you in there.